good morning. How are you today? So glad you're here with us. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are in part four of a four-part series we're calling What's Next? What's next for your next decade? Because we did just turn the corner of another decade, certainly another year, and we want to make sure and get things right, get off to the right, uh, the right steps. You know, when you start out, uh, the start sometimes has a big, a, a big change, right? I mean, it, it determines a lot. I know when I get up in the morning, if I eat the right way I should eat, it kind of helps me eat the rest of the day a little better. Uh, maybe you're like that. And, and when I was in school, if I did well on my first test, it kind of like that set the stage for, hey, this, you know, I'm more likely to do better. And that's what our goal is with doing this series. Hey, let's get it right at the beginning, really kind of get our steps going. And, and, and we started that also, not just with this series, but with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And that ended last night. So... That's pretty fun. I mean, it's cool to, to do it, you know, to pray, uh, put it into turbocharge with some fast. People were fasting different things. Some people, you know, social media. Other, but for me, it was caffeine. So that ended last night. I am jacked today, man. <laughs> First thing I did, man, strong cup of coffee. I'm in it. So I'm having a good time and uh, loving, loving life and all the things that go with it. But, you know, hey, listen, we, our theme verse for this series has, has really been about vision. So it's on your outline. We're going to go th- through three different translations today because it's really important. Where there is no vision, people perish. And that's a sad state of affairs, but it's very true. Vision, vision is something that draws us. Listen, when you don't have vision, and by the way, the Hebrew word for that, where, where this is uh, in the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, is the word calzone. 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 It's like this, you know, some of you had calzone for lunch, you know. Yeah, I like calzone, but listen, if you like calzone, this is, you need this kind of calzone. This is passion. This is it, something that draws us. We don't have to be driven by something. We're drawn to it. It's something that, that uh, gets us fired up. This, we need calzone. Otherwise, you end up perishing. You perish emotionally. You perish relationally. Some of you, it may not be physically, but it's, it's, it's absolutely a form where you're just dying. Another translation here, this is the, uh, it says, where there's no revelation. This is the NIV. This is the translation I primarily use. People cast off restraint. In other words, they don't, they don't have a revelation for their life. They don't know where they're going. And so they just say, oh, there's no restraint. In other words, you only live once, right? YOLO. Right? But I don't, I, don't, I don't really think YOLO is accurate anyways. It's, it's YOLT. You only live twice, not you only live once. You know, you only live twice because you end up, you know, standing before God for the life you live. But how we live is so important. And, uh, and we cast off restraint. Like, in other words, why not do it? And so we end up making, you know, just we cast off restraint. We just, okay, and cast off our marriage and cast off our emotions and cast off, you know, the, you know things in our life. And we end up, as some of you have, have just kind of, uh, you know, you're living in a fog and you've cast off restraint in your morals. And you think, ah, I'm not even living up to my own standards, much less God's. And so often what we try to do when we find ourselves in that situation is we think, well, what we're going to do is we're, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, get it, come back to church. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're listening online saying, I'm just, uh, you know, maybe I, I've, I've cast off too much. I need to come back and, 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 and put some restraints on it. That's not how it works. That'll never be enough. What you need is a revelation. You need a vision. There's something bigger than your habits and your issues you're dealing with and your problems. That's, that's something that draws the best out of you. And here's another translation. If people can't, now this actually is more of a paraphrase than a translation. Somebody took a translation and then they made kind of it in, in, in the language of, you know, the easiest way to understand it. He says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. That's a great way of saying that. You know, if you don't see, if you can't clearly see, if you wear glasses and there's a smudge on your glasses, and, you, you know, and, and it's kind of dimly lit, you, n- you end up bumping into stuff, stubbing your toe, you're, you're stumbling. And some of you, that's the way you are when you don't have a vision, you don't have revelation, you don't know what God's doing in your life. You stumble in your finances, you stumble in your marriage, you stumble in those things in your life. 
And so he says, but when they attend to what he reveals. So some of you, that's what you need to be doing. And that's what we've been talking about in this series, is attending to what God is, wants to do in your life. Attending to the purpose. You know, the number one question people have is, is you know, even atheist people, they, they wonder, you know, is there more to life? Is there more? And another way to answer the, ask that question is, is, what is God's purpose for my life? That's the number one question I hear. What is God's purpose for my life? And so you need to be attending to what he has for you, what he wants to reveal, and they are the most blessed. When you discover that, that's another, other translations say, you know, instead of blessed, they say happy. And what they're referring to with that term, neither of those terms are really that good at capturing the, the, the idea. What it's referring to is this, this idea that I have contentment in my soul regardless of my circumstances. Contentment in my soul. That's what it means to be blessed. It's not just about finances or great vacations. No, it's I have contentment in my soul, regardless of what's going on in my surroundings. And so that's what God has for you. He wants you to step into that. Okay? So how do we how does that happen? Well, God says He wants He has a way of life. He has a pathway. You will show me the way of life, he says, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. God wants you to have joy. How do you have joy? By finding the pathway that God has for you. Living for what God has for you. God says, I have joy for you. And you step into that and say, God, I want that. Now, listen, the devil does not want you to have joy. He does not want you to have pleasure for living. He has a counterfeit. He says, oh, if you do this, this will give you joy. Not the, and the joy that Jesus talks about when, and the Bible talks about is not the ha-ha joy. I mean, it's like a deep inner joy regardless of the circumstances, knowing I'm doing what God has for me. I'm, I, the happiest people I know are not the people with the least amount of problems. It's the people that have a reason for living that's bigger than their problems. You know, just they're focused. They're moving towards something. They're not just focused on their problems. They have as many problems as everybody else. But they're focused on something. They're saying, I'm doing what God has for me. But the devil, he does not want that. He says, the thief, that's Jesus talking. He's talking about the devil. He says, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. See, Andy, you believe in the devil? Well, Jesus did. And he, I mean, I don't, I mean, I know some bad things happen. But Jesus, he's like, he's telling us the truth. He's going, hey, there actually is an evil presence that wants to harm you. In what way? He wants to kill, destroy and, 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 and steal, steal, kill, and destroy anything that you have of value that God has for you. So, but Jesus says, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, have it overflowing. I love that. But, you know, it's easy to live below the vision that God has for you. It's easy to not have the life that's overflowing. And it's certainly frustrating for me when I talk to people and I see that they're living below what Jesus paid for. We talked about that two weeks and what Jesus, how he came and he paid a huge price on the cross. And he did that for you so that you could live this full life. I mean, why would you want to live anything below what Jesus paid for? I mean, I always want my money's worth. How about you? A number of years ago, I guess I was thinking about it this morning. I couldn't remember exactly. I think it's around 12 years ago. You know, Sharon and I have been married 30 years. That's a long time. 30 years. And we're still married. That's a miracle. Praise God for that. <laughs> it's not easy. Anybody married 30 years, it's a miracle, okay? I mean, that's, that's a big deal. It's been difficult sometimes. And, and, uh, and, and Sharon and I, we, we, we have, in some senses, there's some things we, great, we do great together. Some things we sparks fly. So we've had a lot of marriage counseling over the years. And, and you know, about 12 years ago, we were kind of in a difficult place. And, uh, and so we decided to go to this place that does group counseling. It was out in Colorado. So we flew out to Vail, not to ski, which is what I wanted, but to go to group counseling. Ten days of it in a home with these two counselors and then, and then all these other families or other couples that were struggling with things. And, and we're there ten days. Hold up in this. I mean, that's, that's like rotor rooter stuff, man. That is tough. And we were digging through stuff, trying to resolve some stuff. Some of you are going, I would never do that. Well, listen, I'm still married. That's all I can say. You know, you know that's, that's the kind of stuff we had to do to get through some, some difficult times. But, you know, it was expensive. 
it was expensive. The fl- it was all on us. We had to pay for the flight, and it was expensive. The, the counselors, all that kind of stuff, all the food. And so we kept saying, let's get our money's worth. You know, we're here. Let's, you know, because you only, anything like that, you only get what you put into it, right? And so we kept saying, Man, I want my money's worth. Listen, you need to get everything Jesus paid for for your life in Christ. Jesus paid for a lot, and he wants you to have a life that overflows to the full. Don't settle for anything less than that. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's four things that I see in Scripture all throughout the Bible. Number one, it's to know God. That's the, that's the step in. That's the first step, to know God. Not just to know Him intellectually. You see, when Sharon and I started this church 25 years ago, it was not because uh, this area needed more churches. It's not to grow uh, an institution. It wasn't to try to grow a big church. People aren't interested in that. No, it, that, the, people, we don't need more religious people. We don't need more religion. What we did need is people that had a relationship with God, and they understood that God loved them deeply, and they, and they got it, and they could c- c- connect with God through Jesus Christ, and he was a friend. Listen, God loves you so much that if, he, if God had a refrigerator, he would have your photo on it. He would, because he loves you deeply, and he wants you to know him. And, and so we, this word know is not just knowledge-wise, it's in here. I know God, I, I love him, I, I connect with him. Notice this verse here, it says some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. Now that sounds important, right? What's the most important thing in life? They don't even know God. That's so sad. But listen, every single human on earth has a piece of divine in them. God created them, every person in, their, in his image, the Bible says. And he actually deposits a, a little, that life source in them. And, and it's not alive until they come to Christ and, and Jesus kind of regenerates that and causes that to come alive and puts power in your life. But it acts as a homing beacon, a homing device, that longing to be reconnected with your creator. That's the way God designed all of us. And so we don't want to miss that. And so God's, God, God's drawing you home. He wants you to know him. And then to find freedom. And by the way, you can't get to finding freedom until you know God, because God gives you the power to find freedom. What, fr- freedom from what? Well, or habits, or hang-ups, or addictions, or shame, the things were, 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 were uh, the pain in our life that, that holds us back, that colors the way we see things. You can't move forward because you're stuck in some things in your past, some unforgiveness, all kinds. And we try to resolve it. We have ways that we uh, try to resolve that through pills and through therapy and through sex and food and booze, all kinds of things. But that's not God's plan. There's nothing wrong with all of those things. Listen, the thing is, is that God has a pathway for you to receive freedom. And we talked about that two weeks ago because we're kind of going recapping a little bit of the series. First week we talked about the importance of knowing God and, and then finding freedom and what Jesus did for that. But another part of finding freedom is found in community and small groups. That's why we do small groups and those will be launching next week. Next week is our small group launch. We do semesters and we're going to ask you, would you sign up for 13 weeks? 13 weeks. You go, what's secret about that? Well, there's nothing really secret. If it just goes with kind of the rhythm of life, we've discovered that that kind of, you know, it's, you do it for 13 weeks. And it needs to be more than just a few weeks because, listen, when you're, if, you've, if you've never been in a small group, let me tell you how it goes down. You show up and you don't know other people, and so you're kind of protective because we're all like, we're wired that way. And so it goes around the group and, you know, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. How you doing? Oh, yeah, good. never been better. And it's all not true. It's all, you know, I didn't want to say you're lying, but you're lying. It's not because why we don't feel, we don't feel comfortable, but it's, it's around week four or five when you can start to really open up and go, really, that's, that's not at all true at all, man. This is what's going down. This is what I'm going through. And you start building a trust and you praying for one another and you encouraging one another, regardless of the curriculum, regardless of the curriculum, God's spirit shows up. And we find freedom through relationships in small groups. So we encourage you to be involved in a small group. It says, so if Jesus says, so if the son, that's the son of the son of God, that's he's talking about himself. Jesus sets you free. You are free through and through. This is the kind of freedom that God wants you to have. 
where you're, where you're free once and for all. You are free once and for all. And it's only once you're free, you get the smudge off your glasses that you can see what God has for you and you can discover your purpose. Some of you, you have not discovered your purpose because, and here's the thing is you've been looking, you've been trying, you've read some books and you still can't figure out your purpose. Listen, if that's you, chances are you are still not free because if you're not free, you cannot move forward. You cannot move forward. So this is that you cannot skip any of these steps and discover your purpose. God has a purpose for your life. The two best days in your life, in everyone's life here, including my own, is the day you were born. That's pretty cool, right? You're alive. And the day you discovered why you were born. That's where most people don't go. Why was I born? What did God do in my life? And we have a program to help you with that. We don't need your whole life. We only need four hours. It's called Growth Track. You hear about it all the time here, Growth Track. Four hours we ask you just to take a month aside, stay one hour after the service you'd regularly attend, and go through our growth track. We will help you. We're going to partner with you, help you to figure out how God wired you, how God designed, designed you. Because part of the way God designed you, he, that reveals what he has for you. And so we want you to, to, to be part of it. Now listen, some of you, some of you here, listen up. Some of you, your purpose is to help others find freedom. Others find freedom. You can do that. And how do you do that? By leading a small group. And we'll teach you how to do that. We want you to be somebody who helps. Some of you, that's what you're supposed to do. And you're thinking about it. You're going, I don't know. We'll help you. We'll make, we'll, we'll make sure. We'll partner with you. We'll teach you everything you need to know. And that's an awesome thing to do, is to, is to help set other people free. That's what Moses did, right? He, God said, set my people free. So you're like a little Moses, you know. I get to be a little Moses. You, you know, you can show up at your first small group with a big staff. <laughs> What's that? I'm Moses, baby. I'm here. I'm setting God's people free. How do you do that? Right after this service, right after this service in Dream Team Central, which is upstairs. You go upstairs, and in Dream Team Central, uh, you can go and say, hey, I'd love to be a uh, small group leader, and we'll train you today. We, well, they're waiting for you, and so some of you need to do that. Right before you leave, you need to do that. And then lastly, oh, here, this verse. Make a careful exploration of who you are and work uh, for the work that you have been given, and then sink yourself into that. He says, when you discover what you're supposed to be doing, you go all in. You just you say, hey, I want, to, I want to be part of that. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. And so you're responsible for your life. You, God's given you that, and he says, I want you to do it. And then this last part, which we're going to talk about today, is make a difference. Make a difference. God wants you to make a difference. He wants you to, uh, he's created you to do that. That's, that's what ultimately brings you joy. You find joy by making a difference because that's the way God created you. Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory. What, God, what brings the Heavenly Father glory? He says that you bear much fruit. What's he talking about? Making a difference. Using your spiritual gifts to serve others, to make a difference in people's lives. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's God's will for you. He goes, I want you to be filled with joy. It's the same word again. He says, like he said, I want your joy to overflow. Here it is. I want your joy to be complete, to be through your whole life. How? By making a difference. Making a difference not just here on earth, which is important, but also uh, in eternity. And so we always partner that together. We are very interested in civil rights. We're very interested in social justice. But we're also interested in eternal justice. And, in, and, and eternal rights. We want people to know God and, and to, be down, to be good with God and be friends with God and be at peace with God down in their soul, to have that contentment in their soul regardless of their circumstances. So they go together. And so here what we like to say is this, my ultimate purpose in life is to make a difference for eternity. So we're making a difference, but we're doing it for eternity. That's part of what we do with the dream team. When you go through Growth Track, we want you to serve in the Dream Team because we've partnered together to make a difference in people's lives that affects their eternity. And so we invite you to be part of that. Now notice this. It says, in the same way, Jesus says, in the same way that you gave me a mission, 
Jesus is talking in the world. I give them a mission in the world. He's talking about his disciples. So if you're a disciple, he goes, I've given you a mission. What mission is it? And he goes, it's the same mission. It's the mission about, about, about sharing the good news. He says that over and over. And Jesus was clear on his mission. When he was 12, his family goes down to Jerusalem for a festival, for a big party. And they leave thinking Jesus is with them. So uh, later that night, Joe and Mary look at each other and go, whoa, we lost Jesus. That's kind of weird. How would you like to be the person who loses Jesus? Yeah, I lost Jesus once. But So they come back. They find him. He's there sharing the good news with, with teachers of the law and different people. And Jesus says to them, hey, you didn't have to worry about me. Thanks for coming back. But I'm about my father's business. He goes, I'm on mission at 12. And then speed up the clock all the way to when he's dying on the cross. The last thing he says is, it is finished. What's he talking about? His mission. He was clear on his mission from beginning to end. I have this mission. And he goes, I want you to be on mission as well. He invites us. Paul says it this way. I don't care about my own life. That's a big statement just by itself. I don't care about my, it's not all about me. It's not all about me. The most important thing is that I complete my mission. What is that? The work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. You say, isn't that the church's mission? Isn't that, uh, pastor, your mission? No, that's all of our mission. We're disciples. Jesus said, the verse we just looked at, the same mission that Jesus had, he gives. We're the body of Christ. And so part of being the body of Christ means we're doing what Jesus would do and did do in his body. We carry on that mission of being the good news. Uh, Notice this verse. I don't care. Oh, excuse me. Next verse. He says, um, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He says, from the very beginning, he planned good works. That's his mission. You're to carry it forward. And that's part of having that, that vision, that calzone. I get it. This is the thing that, I'm, that I was made for, that I have a passion for. And, and it's, it's unique in some ways, but it's also something we share, sharing Uh, this moving towards this vision. It's very important. God wired us to have a passion that draws us. A number of years ago, back in the early 1900s, there was a guy named Owen Smith who got interested in uh, greyhound racing. Greyhound racing wasn't really a big thing back then because it was so gruesome. They would take a few dogs. They had a straight runaway, no bends or anything, a straight runaway, and uh, and they would let go, they would give like a hundred yard head start to this jackrabbit, a live jackrabbit. And they would send, and of course the jackrabbit was terrified, running from these greyhounds that were, that, and whoever got to the jackrabbit first won the race, but then they would tr- tear the jackrabbit apart, they would kill it. And I, evidently that when a jackrabbit is dying, it sounds like a screaming baby. And so you're thinking, well, why are you telling me this? You know, but, well, that's, that's why it wasn't popular, right? Nobody wants to go to and see that. So this guy, Owen Smith, he goes, you know, I think that greyhounds will follow something that's not live. He brings that to some of the owners, and they go, no, that's not true. That They, they need that instinctive uh, live animal to really cause them to run. He goes, I don't think so. So he did an experiment. He got a little fluff ball that kind of looked like a rabbit and drug it behind a motorcycle. And the greyhounds took out off after it. He goes, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So he comes up with this mechanism. He's the first one to create the, the uh, uh, look-alike rabbit that's actually a mechanical rabbit that runs on these rails. At the time, they, didn't, they used the technology they had, which was like railroad ties. And it ran, and then they made a bend. They did it at night, added lights, all these things, and it made it popular. And, uh, and the rabbits would run after it. In fact, they didn't even need it to look like a rabbit. He realized that, and then he designed the rabbit so that it only looks like a rabbit from the stands for all the people that are coming to bet on the, the, the dogs. It looks like a rabbit to them. To the dogs, it just looks like a fluff ball. Well, a few years ago in Florida, there was a greyhound track that was running, and the, uh, the, the greyhounds are running after this rabbit. It just starts, the, the mechanical rabbit just starts the bend, and the mechanical rabbit breaks and actually explodes fur, wire, everything goes everywhere. And so the dogs are like confused. They don't have anything to chase. That's all, that was their goal. That all, so some of the dogs lay down and take a nap. <laughs> Another dog runs into a barrier and breaks his ribs. And then the rest of the dogs, they just look at the crowd and they start howling and barking. 
And to me, that's a perfect description of humanity when we don't have a vision, when we don't have a, a rabbit to chase. We either lay down and take a nap, we hurt ourselves, or we just bark and howl at everybody else, right? I mean, you might not think that's funny. I think it's hilarious, because <laughs> that is how it goes down. And, and some of you know that. Either personally you've experienced that, or you've been around people. That, that's, that's their life. God designs us to have a vision. He wants us to have it. And, and, and understanding how that fits in with what God has for us. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. So he's, this is one of the last things Jesus says. He's already been, with, he's already been resurrected. He spent time with the disciples. People have seen him in Jerusalem, his resurrected body, and now he's going to ascend to heaven. And he says this. He says, listen, you need to be my witnesses. Now, this is important because when we're, that's our job. He, not, he doesn't say, be my prosecutor. He doesn't say, to be you know, my defense attorney. He certainly doesn't say, be the judge. He just says, be my witnesses. And so that's what we do. We just, this is what God did in my life. And he gives us three ways to do that. He says, in Jerusalem, which is where they lived, that was their town. Judea and Samaria, those were the surrounding towns, real close to them, but actually different than them culturally and racially, a number of things that were quite a bit different. They were close, but they were different. And then to the, other, uh, to, to the ends of the earth, people you won't even know. And he says, this is how we are to be as witnesses. So we're supposed to be missional. How are we missional? Three ways. Let's unpack that. First, Jerusalem, the people that are closest to you, the people that you live with, the people that you go to work with, people you see, uh, the people you connect with, people, you know, people that know you. And the, it's the most impacting because they know you. They know, they, they, and listen, you can share your, it's easiest to share your faith with somebody who you don't know, a stranger. But it's also the least impacting. Why? You're a stranger. They don't know you. And so this has the most, but it's also the most difficult because people can, yeah, but, you know, you go into, you know, phases, you do this. I know when I came to Christ, it was a big deal for me. Uh, and, and I wanted to tell the people, the first people that came to my mind were my brothers, my sister, my, my, my parents. I mean, I wanted to share, and I was always looking. I mean, I didn't have a program or a plan or anything. I just wanted to share. This is what God's done in my life. I was in passion to reach them, looking for ways to reach my my sister, I prayed with her and, and helped her teach her how to pray. She ended up getting baptized. My stepfather, who I, who I just hated. I mean, I literally hated him. I wasn't a believer. I, I didn't like him at all. He didn't like me. I had moved out a few years earlier. I moved out, I guess, when I was 15. And so I come to Christ when I'm 18. And then I, and then I think around 20, I'm going to the University of Arizona, and I just start having a love for him. I think, you know, the guy I hated, and he still didn't like me. And I, would, I didn't have a car at the time, so I'd get on the city bus. I'd drive, I'd take the bus all the way down to close to where my, my, my mom and my stepfather were. I'd walk, the, it took me like 45 minutes to get there. And then I'd just say, I'm just going to clean up around your house. He'd go, really? What, 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 if you, okay. He goes, you know, whatever. If, that's, if you don't have anything else to do, well, I had other things to do. But I was, I was just trying to figure out, how do I even reach this guy? We've been at odds for years and years. Some things we've said to each other that you can't take back. But, I, but God had put a love, and so I would just, and I'd say, hey, listen, I'll clean up your house. Hey, you mind if I put on some, some mu music for me to listen to? Yeah, yeah, whatever. And I'd put on Christian music, which is kind of a new thing for me. I never even knew that existed, like Christian rock type stuff. And then he'd come up to, first, at first he'd come up and go, what are you doing? That's just propaganda. You know, I mean, I didn't know, you know, how to reach him. And I would just, but over the years, I just started, he started seeing the change in my life. I ended up baptizing him out here at the ocean, leading him to Jesus. Now he's with Jesus. He's passed on. But listen, it's, it, you have the most impact with the people that are closest to you. And so God says, that's where you start. You start Judea and Samaria, the people, those close to me, but different than me. They're different than me. People that, they're not like me. You know, you have people that have different political views. And in this environment, let's be honest, politics is one of the most divisive things in our country now, right? And here in our church, we have, be, we have a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational church, which we've worked hard to get. You go to most churches, I know. I have people that come to this church and go, this church isn't like other churches, and I know. Because, but part of the way we've created that is there's a lot that goes into it, but one of it is, is we have uh, an umbrella of grace as we're trying to understand each other. One of the things we also do is like in our small groups, 
We say, hey, let's not talk politics in our small groups. We're going to have people that are way, way different than you. And we're trying to build bridges. We're trying to connect. We have a bigger mandate we're trying to reach, not just convince somebody of our political agenda. And then to the ends of the earth, people that are far from me. So we want to be a missional church. So how do you do that? Well, make a difference in my world. We've been talking about that. My world. Make a difference with the people that I know, that I connect with. I love this verse. He says, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Notice the message is not, you know, when you die, you're going to fry, you know, but, or turn or burn or any of that. No, it's tell them about what God's done for you. You know, be a witness. And then the mercy he's had on you. And, let, and let, just let that soak. Let them see your life change. It's very, very powerful. And so the people that you know, never walk away from someone who deserves help. Your hand is God's hand. Let me just say, your invitation, when you invite somebody to church, that's God's invitation. You say, hey, I know you're in a difficult place. And you know what? God has, a, he, he's got a plan for you. He loves you. There's people that would want to support you, encourage you. Come and visit uh, the church. And, uh, and that's a powerful thing. And listen, when you invite somebody to church and they're sitting there, that changes church for you. See, before, if you're just you come here by yourself all the time, or you and your spouse, I mean, th- you're just like evaluating things. Ah, that song's not as good as they usually do. Yeah, oh yeah, I like the other singer really better. You know, I like that keyboardist, you know, better than that. You know, or, you know, oh, that's that MC. This, oh, you know, oh, that, Andy's really, he's not on today, man. You know, you, you, I've seen him do a lot better than that. I mean, that's, and, not, and then we just fall into that, right? Because, but that's because, that's not the mission of this church. The mission of, of our weekend services, Saturday, Sunday mornings, is for people to know God. And so when you have somebody sitting next to you that you've invited, and they are far from God, you are in the zone. You are in the zone. Now you have a hold of it. Now you're praying. Oh, God, help, let your anointing fall on that singer. Oh, God, you know, you know, help Andy out. He needs all the help he can get. You know, oh, Lord, when it comes to the end of the service, help them make a decision for Christ. I mean, it just, you're, you're now part of what we're doing. And so, so you're God's hand for that person. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. And some people, they need help now. They don't need help later. They don't need help later. They need help now. Then make a difference beyond my world. So not just in my world, but beyond my world. People that are different than me. And that is more challenging, right? Because they're different, they irritate you, you know, they, they, their views are all wrong, uh, they say things that, that get under your skin, you know, and, and, and so you, you know, here's, here's the advice we get from Paul. He says, whatever a person is like, I try to find what? Common ground, common ground, common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. Paul disagreed with a lot of people on what they were doing, their viewpoints, their, their, their political views, all that. But he said, no, as a Christ follower, I have a higher mandate. I have a higher mandate, and that's to help people know who Christ is. And so I'm always looking to build a bridge, always looking to build a bridge. And then lastly, to make a difference in the whole world. Now, you can't go to the whole world. So how do you do that? Well, we have pieces of the whole world that we're going to make a difference in. And, and by God's leading, he directs us there. And as God leads other churches, they cover areas we're not covering. But one of the things we do is we go to Mazalan, Mexico. Our missions team just left yesterday morning. I was there, in, you know, four in the morning at the, at the airport with them, praying with them as they go off. Many of you support them. Our church, uh, beyond whatever you have supported, uh, our church gives a portion of, of the money towards, towards missions. In fact, 65% of the money you give goes towards you, uh, helping this church. You know, I mean, the kids' ministry, youth ministry, uh, uh, the worship services, the, the funerals, weddings, all, all those kinds of things help small groups run, all the things that need to happen. And then the rest of it is sewed into the, helping the people around us, people that are not like us, people like on missions. And so that's part, when you give, you're helping send that mission. They're, they're right now uh, serving the poorest of the poor, by the way. The poor, if you've not done that, I challenge you to, before you die, if you've never done a short-term missions trip, before you die, 
I challenge you to go on one short-term mission trip. It, you'll, see a whole, you'll see things differently. It, it, God does things. It's not just what you see, it's what God does in you. But we go to the poorest of the poor, because there's already a lot of poor people in Mexico. We go to the people they consider to be the poorest people. One of them is the city dump. Another one is the red light district. Another one is a place that was uh, where all the cast-offs, the d- diseased people went. I mean, we, we've, we, we go to these places where the, the people live with no plumbing, dirt, floors. I mean, and, and like with the people of the dump, for example, we go there, we give them a hot meal, which they never eat. We give them gloves, so that was because they go through the dump. That's how they live, is whatever they can find in the city dump, and then they try to sell it. We give them gloves, we give them sunglasses. There's no trees, no shade. They're in, in, in just incredibly, there's no, no uh, uh, especially in the summer, just blistering hot. And so we look for practical ways, and we share the gospel with them. And we help them, we give them medical. We have a team of, of nurses and a doctor that goes down, that is down there now, that giving them medical care. They don't get any medical care. And so we, we and now who pays for that? You do. Thank you for giving. Because when you give, I'm letting you see that's what happens. We also give some of our, our offerings to the uh, Convoy of Hope, which is a disaster relief program. We love Dis- Convoy of Hope because it's, they, they not only fly into these zones that are hit with hurricanes and earthquakes and all, but they, but they share the gospel. So they've paired them up. And, and so people will come to me after a hurricane or like they're right now they're in Australia because of the fire that's going on out there. And, and, uh, and, the, and they'll say, hey, are we doing anything? Yes. When you give, every week you give, you're helping because Convoy of Help is there. Can we do it? Can you be every, most of us can't be on a, a, an airplane flying to every disaster relief place. And so we partner with Convoy of Hope because that's, that's how we reach the world. That's one of the ways we're reaching the world. Another way is through the internet. We, we live stream our, our, uh, our, our, what we do on the services, and we do that not only locally, but you know, almost every country in the world dials in. We get a report through Google Analytics, except for China, zero. I mean, as big as China, there's not one person. It's because they're not allowed. They shut the internet down there. But, but we, we're reaching the world that way. And so there's, there's, there's expenses that go into making a, a broadcast like that. Who, who, and that comes from you. And let me just tell you one more. One more is we do church planting. In fact, today, right now, concurrently with this service, is the very first launch service of our daughter church in Richmond, up in Short Pump, by Jacob and Aaron Gaines. It's going on right now. They're going to be, they're planting that church. It's going to be a great church. I know it. They're going to win so many people to Jesus and help them figure out their purpose in life. And, uh, and that started way back when Jacob was in seventh grade. And he happened to show up, him and his brothers, at this church. He didn't know the Lord. He was raised in a very dysfunctional home. They didn't even put him in public school. He had no education. And so he showed up and came to Christ. And as God started working in his life, and we partnered with him, and we said, well, you need a GED. And so we had a whole bunch of people that would come. He would come every day, and we would work with him for hours getting him so that he, and it took months and months and months, and he finally passed his GED. Then he started feeling, I think God's call, I got a call in my life to ministry. We sensed the same thing. So we said, well, you need a Bible degree. And so we paid for it. Where'd that money come from? From you. We paid for his Bible degree, and that took several years for him to get a Bible degree. And then as he was starting to get ready to do his launch, uh, we, he, you, know, he, you know, hey, I really think I'm supposed to church plant. This is still several years away. Uh, we said, you know, Jacob, we really think that you need to have a bachelor's degree to be able to reach the people that are up in Richmond and where you're going. And uh, that was, I mean, he, you know his background. He goes, I don't know how I can do that, but it was support. And we paid his entire, he's debt free. We paid for his entire bachelor's degree at Liberty University. Where'd that money come from? It came from you. Listen, when you give financially, that's where that money is going. It's supporting, reaching. So when you hear about people, the churches, that church launching there, people coming to Christ, you helped that to happen through your finances, through your prayer. You got to have a bigger vision. Hey, I'm giving. I'm not. That's why when we talk about giving, we want to make sure it's always connected to be something life giving, 
Not something where it's like begrudgingly, oh, they're trying to wrestle my money out. No, no, no. If, you, if that's your attitude, keep your money. We don't need it. We're doing fine without you. We will do better with you. But we're doing fine without you. But God wants you to see things differently. He says, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. Jesus replied, let me assure you that no one has ever given up anything, any given up anything for love of me and to tell others of the good news who won't be given back a hundred times over. I challenge you, go to your banker, go to your financial advisor and say, because a hundred times over is a hundredfold, that's 10,000%. Go talk to your financial advisor and say, hey, I want a guaranteed investment that I get 10,000% and see how that goes over. (laughs) They'll start talking volatility and all that stuff. No, no. Guaranteed. Well, there's only one place I know where that's given. That's through God. God says, and that's his promise, not mine. He says, when you give, and you give because of the, the love in your heart that God's done in your life, and you give to further the good news, 10,000%. Here's Here's what I want to close on this one. We're talking about your purpose, making a difference, making a difference for eternity. I will never be satisfied with making a dollar when my purpose is to make a difference. It's easy to be satisfied with making that your purpose. Oh, I'll just make a bunch of money. Oh, I'm just going to take the great vacations. Oh, I need a super expensive car. I need two cars. I need three cars. I want this. I want, you know, I want a boat. I want those. There's nothing wrong with all that stuff. That's not your purpose. Don't settle for making a dollar. When God has you, wants, wants you to make a difference in people's lives. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Come Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this space right now. If you're at home and you're, or wherever you're at, you know, you might be in the car, you might be at work, if you're listening, I'm, I, God will meet you right where you're at. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us so much. Lord, I pray for those who have not taken that first step, that very first step of knowing you, not just more religion, not joining a church. That doesn't bring joy. Joy comes from knowing you, knowing our purpose, and it all predicates on that first step. And God has placed a homing beacon in you. There's a desire for you to reconnect with your creator, for you to know him. Sometimes we try things that just don't measure up. Maybe it's religious stuff, rituals, or trying to go to church, or maybe it's just trying to be moral, trying to cast off restraint, say, hey, you know, I'm going to try different things. God's calling you home, saying, no, it's only found through a relationship with Christ. And I want to pray with you right now. If that's you, right where you're at, I just this is the beginning. This is the first step. And you say, today's my day. Some of you, this is your day. This is your day to say, yeah, I want to get to know God. Because out of that, I'm going to be able to find freedom, discover my purpose, and ultimately make a difference. So I want to pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. And this isn't about joining the church. This is about saying, yeah, I want to follow Christ. I, I, I want to know God. And if that's you, I'm going to pray with you. I just want you to follow the prayer that I'm, I'm going to pray. You just pray it where you're at, in your mind, or just whisper it, whatever you're comfortable with. But I'd like you to just tell me, just with all eyes closed, every head bowed, I'd like you to just show me with a show of hands, Andy, count me in on that prayer. Would you do that? If that's you saying, I want to know God, I want to pray to receive Christ, would you put your hand up right now? Just boldly right where you're at. Okay, I see several people in the front, a number. Yep, anybody else? There's some more people, some people in the back. God sees you. Okay, you can put your hand down. Now, you, you make this your prayer. It's not the prayer. There's no magic in the prayer. It's your faith. You coming to God saying, God, this is my raw self coming to you. And this is what you say, just something like this. Say, dear God, forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Forgive me for my own sin. So today, I put my faith in you. Say, I want to trust you, Jesus. Fill me with life. And fill me with joy. Today, I'm taking my 
next step. Would you say, God, show me your love. Help me to see how much you deeply love me. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.